Welcome to Buddha at the Gas Pump. Um, my name is Rick Archer, and we're having we, we're going to do a rather unusual interview today in the sense that, number one, we're outdoors in a beautiful place, California, instead of my little home office with the cat and the dog and, and all that that usually participate in my interviews. And um, number two, this is a very spontaneous interview. Um, my, our, my main guest here is David Loy, Ph.D., and Igor Kufayev, whom I've interviewed twice, is going to participate in the discussion. Um, Igor and I both found David's presentation here at the Science and Non-Duality Conference in California to be fascinating. He, he um, discussed spiritual ecology with Llewellyn Von Lee. And so Igor had the thought to have a little conversation with uh, David and, and put it on tape. Let me explain who David is. Um, he is a Zen teacher. He was the Bessel Family Chair Professor of Ethics and Religion and Society at Xavier University in Cincinnati from 2006 to 2010. His books include Non-Duality, A Study in Comparative Philosophy. He's an authorized teacher in the Sanbo Kyodan lineage of Zen Buddhism, uh, where he completed formal koan training under Zen master Yamada Koen Roshi. And um, he told me that he had spent 20 years in, in Japan on doing this study. So I, I, I've wanted to interview David since I met him here at last year's conference, and so it's kind of um, expeditious or, or auspicious that this all came together as it did. So thank you very much, and thank you, David, for, for doing this. Thank you, Rick. Good to be here with you and to be a part of this. Yeah. Good. Now, I thought we might start by just having you lay out for us what is sort of you know, what really lights your fire these days, and, and perhaps in, in, in terms of spiritual ecology, and I'm sure that'll stimulate, stimulate a discussion that we'll easily fill up a, an interesting hour with. Sure. Well, as, as we all know, we're, we're in some trouble, right? We have an ecological crisis, as well as a number of other ones, and it, this isn't only a matter of uh, climate change, but also things like uh, species extinction, massive extinction events, and overpopulation, and so forth. Uh, and a really important question is, so what's the relationship of this crisis? How do we respond to it? How do non-dualists respond to it? Um, on the one hand, we have a conference like this one here in San Rafael, the Science and Non-Duality Conference, where we're, we're, we're trying to understand the, the confluence of what science has to say about neuropsychology and so forth, and also uh, bring in these great non-dualist traditions. But where's the intersection? And the reason this is a really important issue is that what sometimes happens is that the way non-duality is understood, it actually ends up kind of rationalizing a certain sort of passivity. What I mean by that is if you use the metaphor, for example, of uh, um, say sea and waves or ocean and waves if each of us is is a wave uh, so often non-duality is understood as a matter of experiencing the ground the sea the water and the understanding therefore is if I can touch if I can realize that that ground that quiet place within me where uh, there's no need to go anywhere that doesn't get better, doesn't get worse, then there's a kind of liberation involved with that. I think Igor talked about uh, the witness stage, is sometimes called. But the problem with this is the danger is that it one is tempted then to think that that's all you have to do, to sort of reside there. And so it seems to leave the world, the ecological situation, just free to deteriorate and break down further. So important question. Does non-duality really imply a kind of indifference to what's going on, not only ecologically, but economically in the social world? Mm. And, and as I see it, I mean, my main perspective is Buddhism. Right. And, and I see this as part of a larger problem with westernized Buddhism, because as, as Buddhism comes to the West, there's this interaction. It's not only that Buddhism changes the modern world, but the modern world is changing Buddhism. Mm -hmm. And the danger is that what, what happens in effect is that Buddhist technologies of meditation, techniques, can be extracted from the larger spiritual path and actually used to make you a more efficient um, Stock consumer, broker. stockbroker, uh, uh, sniper, mm. uh, whatever. Mm. Uh, 
there's samurai, samurai mm -hmm. yeah well s which shows that there was some of the same problem yeah. in Japan for example mm -hmm. yeah there's this interesting um, Slovenian philosopher quite important Slavo Žižek who said that as far as he can see Buddhism is the perfect uh, ideology for 21st century consumerism huh. you know it, it gives you it's time out from the rat race, you know, this frantic pace of life that we're all in. And, and it, it allows you to step out of it for a while and sort of recharge and uh, find some peace of mind, but then in a way that enables you to go back into the system. And what I would say is, from, from my perspective, that's still dualistic. It's still making a distinction. It's still reinforcing what I think is the fundamental problem, which is the sense of a separate self. Mm -hmm the feeling that there's a me inside that's separate from the rest of the world outside and that I can pursue the well-being of this me quite apart from what's going on on the outside. Mm -hmm. So in, in terms of that metaphor, the famous metaphor of sea and waves, we have to realize the sea is always taking form as waves. In Zen terminology, uh, it's not just that form is emptiness, but that emptiness takes form. You know, we don't, we don't find the ground really apart from this world. This world isn't just an illusion. This is the form, the constructed manifest way in which this ground takes form and transforms. And, and to, to love the ground is to love the forms with which it manifests, especially at this really critical time in history when collectively we are doing so much to to destroy and, and damage yeah. it it's interesting um, I have friends who've been meditating for decades and you know some of whom I would consider highly awakened and yet they have political and economic philosophies that I don't seem to me to be at all compassionate or to reflect any sort of sense awareness of the essential oneness of everything and I don't know how they can do that it, it puzzles me well, there really does seem to be a kind of compartmentalization, mm. which I think happens often. It often happens even with, uh, you know, spiritual teachers who sometimes do very immoral or unethical things. One way to say it is, it's not that, it's not that we are awakened, but there is something in us that is a, that can become awakened. But just because that's awakened doesn't mean everything else about it hasn't us is awakened. Necessarily percolated into exactly. our relative. Exact, yeah. Exactly, yeah. Uh -huh. To me, the great challenge of our time, as East and West come together, is to see the non-duality between personal transformation and social transformation. Mm. I mean, we know, of course, that Asian forms, Indian, East Asian forms of personal transformation has, have emphasized the individual. Right. And l since that's been happening in non-democratic societies, that's what they've had to focus on. Yeah. But now we come into contact with a, a modern world largely informed by the West mm -hmm. where um, I think the, the highest ideal is something that comes out of the Abrahamic tradition, social justice. Mm -hmm. Combine the Hebrew prophets with what the Greeks realized about democracy, the fact that we can, we can transform our society if we want. And I think that's at the at the heart of what we've been able to create today not only democracy but uh, human rights women's rights mm -hmm. anti-slavery civil rights I mean this this development of justice mm. right so which is more institutionally focused I think now we're at a time when we can see the necessity of bringing the two of these two together yeah. we can see the limitations of either one by itself and and one way to say that is simply we're talking about two types of freedom that need each other right mm -hmm. the individual freedom freedom from our own greed ill will and delusion that traditions like Buddhism and, and Hinduism are working focusing on but also the kind of institutional freedoms that the Western tradition traditionally focuses on mm -hmm. and we need both as yeah. Gary Snyder, he, he, he put it wonderfully exactly 50 years ago. He said that um, the mercy of the West is, has been social revolution. The mercy of the East is insight into the basic self slash void or realizing the emptiness of the self. Mm. And he ended by saying, we need both. Mm.
feel free to uh, reach for the mic at Igor anytime you're ready for, to say something. Um, so do you see that as a, a kind of a direction that's taking place in contemporary non-dual and spiritual circles? Is, is there a, an integration uh, taking place or is it really in a, in a very fledgling stage and, and needs a whole lot of shepherding along to become significant? It's a very good point. Uh, just speaking in terms of socially engaged Buddhism, um, which is what I'm most familiar with, um, in certain ways it's a victim of its own success in that certain types of social engagement, especially what we might call service, helping homeless people, uh, hospice work, prison work, this is generally accepted and it's become very important and it's wonderful. But on the other edge of the spectrum, I mean, we not only need to help homeless people, but we need to ask why in the richest country, place. exactly, <laughs> and why are, why are they increasing right. in a country that is by far the richest that's ever existed, you know? Yeah, why do we have the largest per capita prison po population of any country in the world, you know? Exactly, right. exactly. Another way of saying it is we're often the engaged Buddhists are busy sort of fishing people out of the river who f floating by in the river, but you know, there comes a point when you start to ask, well, who's pushing them in around the bend? You yeah, know? <laughs> yeah, very good point. Of course, you know, a lot of times we feel powerless. There's just, uh, you know, the, the forces of the world are so huge and, the, you know, the corporations and, you know, governmental forces and so on. And here we are, you know, are this handful of so-called spiritual people. And, you know, you feel like, well, what, what could you really do aside from just you know, focus on this little prison project or this little homeless project or something, and, and but it's a drop in the bucket. Mm -hmm. And you know, global warming is this massive thing. We're at 390 or 400 parts per million of CO2 in the atmosphere, which is unprecedented in tens of thousands of years. We shouldn't have gone any higher than 280, and yet we're in totally in uncharted territory. And what's that going to mean 20 or 30 years down the line? And you know, a lot of people get a little bit discouraged and, and begin to feel that it's lost cause and you know I might as well just you know make sure I don't reincarnate again because it's gonna be hellish around here next time <laughs> this is exactly where I think spirituality is so important you yeah. know uh, because well for example in Buddhism we have this archetype that's called the Bodhisattva mm -hmm. and the mythology is 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 a little off I think it, it's the idea that somebody can be awakened and be on the on the verge of sort of disappearing from this world altogether, but they choose to stick around and help the rest of us. I think this misses the point. I think, in fact, the bodhisattva ideal has a lot more to do with the fact that as we begin to wake up and realize that we're not separate from the world, and this is my, this is sort of my definition mm -hmm. of waking up, realize that I'm not inside looking out at a world separate from me. As we realize that we're non-dual with the world, then that doesn't in itself necessarily get rid of these old self-centered habits and, and ways of thinking and acting. And what the task of the Bodhisattva is then is to start transforming one's motivations, one's way of living in the world, so that instead of asking, um, you know, I'm, I'm separate and how can I get what I want or what I think I need out of the world, we start to turn that around and we ask, uh, okay, if I am the world, if I'm one of the countless ways in which all of this is coming together, then this is my body, this is who, this is what I really am. What can I do, given my situation, the kind of person that I am, what can I do to make it a better place? Mm. And clearly we're now in a critical situation where I think the earth is calling upon all of us to be bodhisattvas, but I, I didn't actually get to what I think is so distinctive about the bodhisattva thing. You're exactly right. We tend to feel overwhelmed. The problems are so huge. But in the Buddhist tradition, at least, the bodhisattva classically takes a vow to help all living beings in the universe wake up. Mm -hmm. Whoa. Big job, yeah, you know, it's big like universe. big universe. So it's like, you know, you don't hold your breath, right? right. It, you can say it's more constructing the meaning of your life, sort of meaning, basing the meaning of your life. And so you're working in a certain kind of direction. Well, think about it a minute. I mean, if somebody has taken that vow, are they going to be put off by the fact that climate change is, is pretty tough or we have a really corrupt political system or 
a self-destructive economic system. And not only that, but so often social activism tends to burn itself out. You know, you get out there, you, you have this goal-oriented, and it just doesn't work out the way you hope it will, and so you get frustrated. But the whole point of the Bodhisattva path is that Bodhisattvas are working on both sides at the same. You see, because you're working on your own, deepening your own awakening, even as you're also going out in the world and trying to make, you know, reform structures, the kind of activism we need, the two sustain each other and the two really become, as I see it, two parts of the same spiritual path. Yeah. It would also seem to me that if you're really sort of uh, worthy of using the term bodhisattva, however loosely, to, with, you know, with regard to yourself. Then you, then by that time, you you perceive yourself as being much more than an individual, poor little guy who can't do very much. You are the creative force that's you know breathing right. in these trees and that's giving rise to this whole universe. Right. And so that its very uh, nature is to keep doing. To, to keep promoting uh, the evolution of all beings in the universe. Right. I mean, that's presumably why the universe came into existence. Right. Yeah. You know, and so if, if that's your primary identification, then it's kind of a, a you know, a done deal, slam dunk. You, that's your that's your driving force. But the only thing I'd add to that, if I understand you right, there's a little bit of a danger there that I hear sometimes expressed that people say, well, I'm not a bodhisattva. That's far away from me. So I've got to keep focusing on my own awakening. And, and to some extent, that's true, of course. I mean, the spiritual path, we start on our own personal transformation, definitely. But some people seem to think, I'm going to ignore the rest of the world until I'm really so deeply enlightened. Yeah. And, and that kind of self-preoccupation, I think, is actually reinforcing the fundamental problem. Mm. Whereas I think do, we need to constantly engage with the world in whatever way we can, integrating whatever it is that we've realized and integrating whatever ways that we ourselves have been transformed up to that point. So it's a reciprocal process yeah. that the that the constant constant lessening of self preoccupation that happens when we're engaged in the world is a very, very important part of this personal awakening that we're talking about. So I don't wanna mm. I don't wanna separate What I'm them. suggesting is uh, yeah. You know, what I'm suggesting is that um, it's not it's becoming more and more common to encounter individuals whose genuine experience is that the world is my body you know I, there, the oneness is there such right. that it, there's as much uh, I, is, I am not just this individual at all uh, this is an instrument through which life is being lived but I am essentially the the soul in the tree in the grass in the mountains I, I I'm I'm everything uh, and it's all within me mm -hmm. and so from that Gen not just as a kind of a nice philosophical concept, but a, as a living, breathing experience that is becoming more and more commonplace. And such individuals really are, and they're not individuals, it's, you know, the, t the terminology, terminology trips you up. Uh, such people <laughs> uh, really are that bodhisattva consciousness that is infusing evolutionary um, juice into the world and thereby helping hopefully to transform it. I think Igor is ready to say something. Um, what I feel like um, perhaps would be the to, uh, to bringing this um, beautiful um, unfoldment that David just um, sort of shared with us is that what I feel personally is that what is lacking in the contemporary spiritual dialogue is the very fact that we molding our environment, we molding the world we live in, literally, literally by the way we perceive that world. Mm. And the modern science, modern science, speaks of that phenomenon more than ever. The the whole the whole uh, paradigm that we found ourselves in, the whole predicament that this global civilization is now found itself is that it became the civilization of the consumers but how did it all become the civilization of consumers 
because the objectivity of the world what was put was put as the main main reason for existence the world became when well, since the world was reduced to this one grand machine empty of any consciousness source of resources source of resources the earth was viewed as mm -hmm. the object everything that was inside the earth was viewed as further objects and to the degree that we actually start started to treat people ourselves animals all the species trees everything our environment as objects whenever where does that reductionistic view comes from and this is very important uh, to understand that uh, spiritual dialogue is not separate from what is happening today what is happening today in the let's say overall arena of discussion of how do we proceed from here mm. this is what you've addressed with Llewellyn during the discussion yesterday a little bit. Precise, yes mm -hmm. precise you've touched up on these mm -hmm. uh, topics that if we do not incorporate that if we do not make that part of the spiritual dialogue then we continue to perpetuate that kind of separation that spiritual evolution is somehow s chiefly belongs to the existential domain of our existence and what we do out in the world is entirely different matter and as you said the mm -hmm. buddhism became a very perfect a refuge where you use buddhism as an sort of like a rejuvenative place where you can dive back into the world of consumerism self-help self-help exactly so that the once great tradition of uh, transformation of consciousness is being now utilized for the same very needs that we're trying to transform and trying to move away from so it seems to me that the um, solving the problems on the le level of the problems is not going to do anymore you know they have we have to introduce the third factor we have to go as you said not saving those who drown down the river but we have to go behind the bend and see where they how did they end up being in that river in the first place and it seems to me that the the reason why why we ended up finding ourselves drowning at the moment drowning in not finding solutions you know and we're trying we're trying the whole world is like trying to find the answer to that perplexing dilemma some voices are gravitating towards almost painting a very bleak picture and you know on the other side the optimists who are saying that it will all somehow will take care of itself and where does that position finds each and every of us individually within the heart and this is why I believe personally that the attitudes the prevailing attitude that somehow somehow the perception of the world is independent from the way we perceive it is an erroneous understanding it is the world is as we see it as Rishi Vashishta said mm -hmm. the world is as we perceive it so but in that can change exactly mm -hmm. in other words in other words we mold the world with some total of our perception of it so if we perceive the world as pure object we are we are forming that morphological crystallized structure of objective universe where there is everything everything can be reduced to just that very level and we find ourselves caught in that objective universe of unrelated matter when on the other hand when on the other hand scientists are now openly confirming the experiences of mystics spiritually awakened people that what once believed to be matter or object suddenly becomes a field of possibility suddenly becomes the vibrating field of energy this is particles versus versus waves so when our perception of the world changes with that change with that change we change the world because we perceive the world differently mm. and this is where i want to place an emphasis and this is why i would like 
a certain dialogue to be opened up. Many great spiritual um, leaders, many great masters have spoken of the importance of the way we kick this universe. Every thought, every emotion, every feeling we have has an impact on a greater whole because the size here does not matter. Sometimes you hear, well, but what can I do? I'm a small little individual in this whole cosmic game of what have you, whatever you call it, you know, caught in the will of samsara. And yet, and yet, at the same time, scientists tell us that because of this law of non-locality, the grain of sand contains the entirety of the universe. Thence, to speak of something small versus big is irrelevant. Every, every feeling and every thought counts. And this is where I, I feel is that corner, that bend of the river where we fall into that place where we then need to be rescued. Once our perception changes, then we start forming and we start we are not actually start, the word start is irrelevant. Instantaneously we are making and creating another reality. We're creating reality through, through the way we perceive reality differently. Because that is in, interdependent. This is how, you know, how little I understand of modern science. This is how that works. This is the observer effect. So it's like literally the world is no longer solid, no, the world is no longer crystallized matter. The world is suddenly becomes increasingly Im imbibed with infinite possibilities. So we find ourselves in that place in time where we can actually have a quantum leap from the place of like, um, in again going back to that discussion which gave birth to this one, yesterday the one that you had with Lowlin, is that Actually, when something is dying, something is being born simultaneously. So this, this process of dying of the civilization and dying of this v system of values that outlive themselves, we are in the process when we're witnessing this a new birth. And we have to be very tuned. We have to be intuitively uh, acute. We have to be literally, literally hear the whispers of our innermost heart of what is that new that is you know in a budding state the new story why not a new story yeah. you know and yeah. we are the we are the sculptors we are the molders we are the ones that you know like we're creating that social sculpture we're creating a new uh, let's say model of interacting so that that we don't solve problems we don't go around plastering the wounds of the earth, the wound of the wounds of the world. Earth can heal itself, you know, like this great power of that is embedded in that absolutely conscious of itself, uh, beautiful, living, pulsating echo organism. But what we can do, we can willingly participate in that process, and this is what I feel is very much. Um, this is why I felt it's like the, the, the messages that you were conveying yesterday mm. in that uh, dialogue, that, in that panel, is that it's so timely because when people feel that uh, existential quest for self, let's say, in whatever way you call it, enlightenment, you know, emancipation, it's not, it's not removing oneself from the world and allowing the world to take care of itself. This, this is the greatest delusion because, because, if two, three people saying that, there is an army of those who follow way before they reach that state, way before they reach that state of emancipation. And they are withdrawing themselves, so to speak, from that very important partaking. They basically, um, they live neither in a state where they transcend it, let's say, um, the gross aspects of reality and abide in their essential nature. It's just they've created this kind of um, attitude, a mood, and by not fully understanding this engagement in the world, like of 
of what you have beautifully spoken about as the real role of the bodhisattva, they become, they become, literally they um, withdrew from the world. It's like the annihilation, it's like the story of India of the past thousand years, that completely India became the subject of many foreign invasions, precisely because of misunderstanding of the whole notion of illusion, Maya, because the world was negated as, it's not real, why to bother? Well, that's, you know. Um, another way to, to express or what, what you're saying or a, a large part of it is, is the need for a new story. You know, we, we perceive the world and we act in the world in the way that we do because of our stories about it. And you could even say the world is made up of our stories. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. And um, the problem is, well, first of all, it's fascinating that suddenly in the last year or so, this is what everyone is, seems to be working toward, the realization that the old story, which is really, you know, behind, I think, the ecological crisis and the economic crisis, the behind a lot of the other breakdowns, we also have a story crisis because if we believe that the universe is simply a bunch of dead matter and that we're just accidental forms of that matter that have no meaning, we're here just formed for a little while and then we dissolve and there's no meaning, there's nothing, there's no continuity, nothing, then truly this has extraordinary implications for how we live both individually and also collectively in terms of what we do to the earth. The new story is, is getting quite fascinating. The old one, I think, if you look at what's really motivating, say, our economic system now, I don't think it's Adam Smith's invisible hand, that's the old capitalist rationalization. I think it has a lot more to do with social Darwinism, you know. Survival of the fittest and yeah. every man for himself. Right, and, uh, and yeah. which isn't what Adam uh, Darwin himself taught, right. right? But as God disappeared and Darwin refuted the last good argument for God, the, God, the idea of uh, the argument from design, I mean, once you have evolution, you don't need God to create all the species, you see, in any, in any simple way. But because God was the source of meaning and value, when God disappears, you've got a kind of ethical void. And what leaps into the void? Well, a kind of social Darwinist ethic that I think is still prevalent today. We don't call it social Darwinism. We call it, uh, it's Ayn Rand or somebody like that. But it's, it's, in Buddhist terms, it's a rationalization for greed, aggression, and the delusion of a separate self, you see. Mm -hmm. Whereas what we're finding now, it's really exciting. New studies in cosmology and evolution a lot of people are working for this th this new universe story where we understand the universe as as an organic living whole that's self-organizing and um, what it really seems to be it seems to me is that the basic stuff isn't even matter or energy but it's like fundamentally it's it's creativity constantly taking different forms transforming complexifying gaining higher consciousness uh, until you get to human beings where it seems to me something very special happens. And this is an important point because you have a dialogue between the old people who think God put us here to control and use everything else versus some biologists and deep ecologists who would say, you know, we're no different than any other species. But I wonder if they both miss the point that um, with with human beings what we have is is new forms of the creative process. That is to say, we're creatures that create. With us, new types of creativity become possible. And to say it another way, in our meditation practice, when, when we learn to disidentify with everything, this also is what enables us to wake up and identify with the whole cosmos mm -hmm. and to take the well-being of the whole cosmos as the meaning of our lives, both again, both individually and collectively. This is huge. I mean, this is a much more, I mean, first of all, we're not some accidental form of dead matter. We, with or us, the, the universe. Or, or the logical progression of evolution. It's not an accidental evolution, as it's like the Darwinist theory. It's just the uh, system becomes more complex and complex, and suddenly we are 
Um, uh, until the universe yeah. becomes aware of itself, which is one way we can understand it. Exactly. Yeah. And I just wanted to yeah. um, sort of to the echoing of what you just said. It's precisely what I meant by the perception of reality, because that's what you call the creative process, because that's what is given to us. And you can, in a way, one can interpret the words of um, Old Testament is that the Adam was put in the garden to take care of that garden because it was in the Adam's capacity. It is in the capacity of the human being. It is in the capacity of the human nervous system, human creativity, because it's absolutely identical, identical in, with the greater cosmos. Because as some of these presenters uh, from the scientific background showed us that man stands right in the middle of the greatest in terms of the human, size humans. humans. Yeah. <laughs> well, it's an old. Uh, yeah. the, the the human stands we in the middle. <laughs> And, and the smallest, so that so that the, in a way that this is the you know the the, the great um, um, the great Adam Kadman, you know the Purusha of the of the Upanishad, the Purusha in the form of the human. So this in a way that like that's what I meant, and then you uh, took it further in terms of the creative process. Like let's say nothing is devoured of consciousness. Everything is consciousness. The tree is consciousness. The piece of rock, as I was saying earlier, that the granite slab has consciousness. And if you zoom in to it and you carry on zooming in, then that inert dense matter will eventually go on the level when everything is dances. There's, you know, there's nothing in the universe, even on that level, is absolutely inert. Everything is relatively inert to, ev to, to something else. So, in human being, liveliness brought to its utmost. In human being, this is where the full world of basically this whole creation rejoices. And we forget that. We forget that, that a human being is indeed unique. And that, precisely in my view, what places us in the uh, position of responsibility. Not in that uh, kind of like patronizing responsibility that we've been so far exercising over the rest of the, let's say, um, species and the earth itself, where we've been sharing the place. But I'm talking about the responsibility from the greater sense, from that what, from, you know, from the responsibility that we are the creative beings with the capacity to literally, literally make anything possible. The tree is just witnessing silently there, and that's what makes us unique. Mm. Um, one of the important things about the the Adam and Eve story that really stands out for me is that God made man, or as we now say, humans, in His own image. Does that mean that the God has two eyes and a vertical nose? No, I mean, if God is a metaphor for the creative process, it means that, you know, with us, Absolutely. this, we, we embody that creative principle in a way that no other created being does, uh, which is, gives us, of course, very special responsibility. But how wonderful it is to realize that the same creative process that, that, that creates a galaxy, the same creative stuff that creates a, a rose bush or, or a rock or this tree is also creating our thoughts and our words right now. That it's, it's, this gives us the kind of non-duality, the kind of new story that, that I think we're going to need if we're going to give life a meaning. And we can see how this, uh, this is a way of explaining that it's with us that the cosmos creates meaning and also creates responsibility for itself. And so, I mean, we're all talking about this story. It, it's really, really exciting, the potentialities built into it. Sorry, I've... No, that's right. <laughs> no, I love that. Um, and you know what you're saying about Darwin kind of taking God out of the equation? <laughs> Maybe he the took God, the old-fashioned concept of God, and, and, and so if we just kind of look a little bit more closely, 
you know, God hasn't gone anywhere. Um, and as, as you so beautifully put it, every single particle of creation is brimming with, with intelligence. Uh, and if you look at anything closely enough, um, you know, see, look at a single cell under a microscope, holy mackerel, that's not just a lot of little billiard balls running into each other randomly. There, there is some incredibly uh, in, intelligent um, orchestration taking place there that, you know, is beyond our, our limited comprehension. And that's, and that, and every single particle, all the trillions of cells, even within our, our immediate view here, are, are, you know, just saturated with that intelligence. And, but as you've been saying, we as human beings are somehow um, an even more developed uh, expression of that. Or we, we're able to sort of channel it more um, intentionally and fully than a blade of grass or, or something. So we're more influential, which kind of gets me to something Igor was saying, and which gets us back to the point of, you know, should we feel hopeless because the the powers that seem to be destroying the earth s seem so vast and we seem so puny you know if you go to a subtler level you have more power um, the chemical level is more powerful you know uh, if you release the energy in a lump of coal it's, it's a lot more powerful than the lump itself you know if you burn the coal or if you went to the atomic level of the coal you know a single lump could probably power an entire city if you could if that were the substance they used to create that kind of you know a nuclear uh, power. So subtler levels, and, and as physicists tell us, you know, the, the amount of energy uh, uh, on some level in, there, in our pinky exceeds, you know, and it's just vast, inconceivable. You know, it, it exceeds the, the, the amount of energy in the manif entire manifest universe. So we have a kind of a, the principle of the fulcrum going on here, where, you know, you, a great big seemingly immovable rock, what are we going to do? But if we have a fulcrum, we can actually move the rock. So being able to function from a subtler level of awareness gives us an, an influence that we wouldn't have if we were just trapped at the surface. And so, you know, spiritual, quote unquote, people uh, need not lament. Um, they, they will and have and are having a powerful influence in the world, creating a new reality, as Ugar puts it, by perceiving a, new, a deeper reality. They're actually manifesting that reality. But I don't think that absolves them from uh, action at all levels. It's not like you can just sit on your butt and meditate and you think, okay, the world's going to change. There needs to be a more, for most people anyway, some should probably do that because it's their nature. But for, for most people, there to really have an impact, you need to kind of you know, be, that, be at that deep level at which nothing ever happened and also express it to the best of your ability. Um, there's, you know, you probably, everyone's heard of Amma, the hugging saint, and she has all these tremendous humanitarian projects that she does, and huge stuff, and, uh, uh, you know, and relentless, you know, ex inexhaustible, just keeps happening. And at one point, one of her swamis asked her, um, Amma, what more can we do for the world? And she said, what world? You know, so she's fully appreciative of the fact that on some level there is no world, mm -hmm. and yet f uh, brimming with compassion for the world that we all appear to live in and doing everything every sh thing she can with every ounce of her strength to make it better mm -hmm. <laughs> Einstein was uh, quite uncomfortable with quantum mechanics famously because uh, he found the unpredictability the an indeterminacy principle really uncomfortable uh, it seems strange, but I wonder if he missed the point here. That uh, you know, as as a physicist, he's looking for he was looking for regularities that he could make into laws. And I wonder if we can say that at the quantum level, this is a, a manifestation of this creativity, which can't be predicted, can't be uh, completely controlled. That that that's that that's part of the process. Just like uh, geneticists know that uh, our DNA. Uh, varies and uh, mutates at a pretty constant rate. Well, that is way, to say, in a way, that's exactly what I meant with the perception of reality. Because when Rick made the comment, I did not mean that just perceiving reality as in in terms of yourself, realized self. What I meant is exactly what you just saying that it is exactly that conscious perception changes reality. Yes, that yeah. the way that that's Creates what a new world. exactly right. I from that, that yeah. place because the, our creativity, creativity is not passive. Mm -hmm. Right, it's always active. Mm -hmm. 
yeah. And that a new story. A is, new, is, is exactly. A that's new that's of, when we weave a new story. That's right. exactly when we reintroduce new mythology or we create create the new story which mm. our children and grandchildren will live. Right. Not very non-dual, I know, but that's. That's how but, I feel. but of course, the challenge now is that you know we've we we can understand who we are and our role in the universe in this new way, but we're challenged by the fact that this is a new story, still, still struggling to be born, and that the social economic world is largely determined by the old story, mm -hmm. and that we're at a point in our social evolution where there's lots of resistance to the change and again I think spirituality has a lot to say it can give us insight into the fact that of course the fundamental resistance here comes from the delusion of separate self right not only the hyper individualism and narcissism of so much of American life but also the way that this ego becomes collectivized and institutionalized mm -hmm. so one of the things I've tried to point out is um, how Buddhism talks a lot about these three poisons, greed, ill will, delusion. Today they seem to be taking institutionalized form. Our economic system is really uh, institutionalized. I mean, this preoccupation with, I mean, if greed is you never have enough, um, isn't that our economic system? Likewise, um, our militarism, institutionalized aggression, our media as institutionalized delusion to control our way of thinking to keep us in this old paradigm to keep us consuming pursuing that as the way to be happy so it's keeping keeping the challenge. old story uh, ro rotating the old story keeping us within that old story and this is I uh, the uh, sp specifically media because like literally the military and everything you can because um, the Goebbels uh, one of the four great, the four most important Nazi yeah. members. He said that you you don't like once you have control of media, that's it. Yeah. You have it's total control. Enough 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 that's you have a total control. Yeah. You know that's the only control you need. You need to have control of the media, mm -hmm. and that will it, by itself control the collective consciousness. And this is exactly where the new story comes into being. This is exactly the new story. This is exactly when we introduce, when we weave in the fabric of our existence, when we no longer, no longer participant, participants or willing participants in that play which outplayed itself. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, when your gestation period is over and you're ready to be born, there's not much that either you or your mother can do to stop it. And uh, you know, I, I think I choose to be optimistic, maybe I'm naive, but I have a feeling that there's an inexorable force moving in the world that um, as powerful and intractable as, as these uh, undesirable situations may be, I, I think that ultimately their days are numbered and that people who kind of think in the, along the lines that we've been discussing sh should feel encouraged and should just, you know, keep their chins up and, and you know, do whatever they can do to uh, further all this along, both in terms of their own development and whatever they can contribute to the world. And um, I, I don't, I feel like we're going to see a brighter day, perhaps well within our lifetimes. So I think we're almost out of camera memory, but is there anything you'd like to kind of conclude with? Mm -hmm. Well, your, your final remarks reminded me of something the English writer H.G. Wells said, that history is a race between education and catastrophe. <laughs> and I think, you know, that's very wise, um, especially education in the broad sense, such as the sort of non-dualist traditions are trying to encourage. And the important thing, it seems to me, is that in recent years, both sides are speeding up. Mm. So, you know, there's, there's definitely a change of consciousness happening, right. but also the crisis is there, and our spiritual traditions have to understand the implication of what we've been saying, that the ecological crisis is also a spiritual crisis. Yeah. 
And perhaps the speeding up of the spiritual is nature's way or that, that cosmic creative intelligence's way of counterbalancing the dire, the, the severity of, of the problems that have been increasing. It's like because nature abhors an imbalance, you know, and so it's rising to, to meet that challenge. And may the better man win, and we know which one's better. <laughs> better human win. <laughs> so I think we're about out of camera memory, so uh, if we can, let's, let's, if I have time to do so, let's wrap it up. Um, you've been listening to a, a rather different episode of Buddha at the Gas Pump. Um, if you'd like to see more of these interviews, uh, go to batgap.com, batgap.com, where there's an ever-growing collection of them. Um, and... Um, if you'd like to be notified of new ones, there's a place to sign up for an email notification. I'll be linking to David Loy's website from bat, batgap.com, and if he has any books on Amazon, I'll link to those. And of course, I already link and will link again to Igor's website so that you can get in touch with these folks um, if you'd like to further the dialogue. So thanks for listening or watching. And our next interview, depending on which order we put these up in, will be Francis Lucille. I'll be speaking to him tomorrow morning. Thanks. <laughs>